welcome to another broadcast of Majoring in the Majors with Pastor S.J. Munson on the Artist First Radio Network. All past shows are available in podcast form. You can find them at artistfirst.com. Your host is the author of two books, The Treasure of Israel and Christ Held Hostage, The Hijacking of American Christianity. Here's your host, Pastor S.J. Munson. Hi, this is Pastor S.J. Munson, and welcome to Majoring in the Majors. Uh, When we think of the religious right in this country, um, we often think of Roe v. Wade, the Supreme Court case, uh, which in 1973 legalized abortion in this country um, and seemed to galvanize evangelical Christians um, throughout America who had hitherto been silent and turned them into a powerful political movement. Or is that really what happened? Is that historically accurate? Um, Here to talk about that this evening is uh, the Reverend Dr. Randall Balmer. He's an ordained Episcopal priest, and he holds the distinguished John Phillips Chair in Religion at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire. He uh, previously taught for 27 years uh, religious history at Columbia University, and he's the author of many books, um, including God in the White House, The Making of Evangelicalism, And Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory, which uh, many may remember was uh, adapted into a very successful and award-winning PBS documentary. His latest book is Bad Faith, Race and the Rise of the Religious Right, which traces the racist roots of the movement. Um, Dr. Balmer, thank you so much for being here this evening to talk with us. I'm delighted to be here, SJ. Thank you for the invitation. Now, um, just to kind of define our terms, when we talk about um, things like the religious right, evangelicalism, or conservative evangelicalism, what exactly are we talking about? Are we talking mainly about white evangelicals, or how do you define these terms? Yeah, certainly with the religious right, we're talking about white evangelicals who became politically active uh, roughly around the year 1980, give or take um, a year or, or two, I suppose. But um, so, yes, primarily white. And I define evangelical, I have a three-part definition. Somebody who believes that the Bible is God's revelation to humanity and therefore should be taken very seriously to the point, many of them, of uh, literal interpretation. Although evangelicals, like other believers, engage in what I call the ruse of selective literalism when they come to interpret the Bible. Uh, Second, an evangelical is somebody who believes in the centrality of a conversion or a born-again experience which, of course, is taken from uh, John chapter 3 in the New Testament. And then finally, an evangelical is somebody who uh, takes seriously the injunction from Jesus to uh, evangelize, to bring others into the faith, uh, go into the, all, all the world and preach the gospel and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So that would be my three-part definition for, uh, for evangelical. And when we're talking about the religious right, yes, primarily we're talking about white evangelicals. Okay, so there's... There's an accepted mythology, I guess you would call it, about the rise of the religious right, how the religious right got started, and um, and uh, it, it, be, it goes something like this, that the uh, conservative evangelicals um, with rising uh, righteous indignation, to quote your book, uh, confront <laughs> the legal abortion in this country, um, but in your book you say, no, that's, that's not what really happened, and... Um, Tell us, tell us what really happened. That oh, you also said that it wasn't about uh, Roe v. Wade. It was first about a court case named Green versus Connolly. Can you tell us what really, really happened? Sure. Well, first of all, I, what you described is what I call the abortion myth. The abortion myth is the fiction, and it is fiction, that the religious right galvanized as a political movement in the 1970s to oppose the Roe v. Wade decision. Uh, Jerry Falwell, for example, uh, wrote about w- waking up on January 23rd, 19, uh, in, uh, 1973, that is, the, the day after the Roe v. Wade decision, and reading about it in the local newspaper and just being um, um, aghast at this, the uh, immorality of this decision. He wrote that, by the way, 14 years after the event. And so um, I guess we might want to question uh, that a little bit. Uh, but uh, uh, just to put this in perspective, in 1968, Christianity Today, which is the sort of the flagship magazine of evangelicalism, uh, 
held a conference with another evangelical group called the Christian Medical Society to discuss the morality of abortion. Now, again, this is 1968. Um, heavyweight theologians from the evangelical world were there for that conversation. And at the end of several days of discussing the matter, they issued a statement saying, we really can't decide whether or not abortion should be illegal, but we think it should be allowed. Several, two successive editors of Christianity Today issued what would uh, generously be considered equivocal statements about abortion. In 1971, the Southern Baptist Convention, which is not exactly known for its radicalism, mm -hmm. passed a resolution calling for the legalization of abortion, which they reaffirmed in 1974, the year after the Roe v. Wade ruling, and again in 1976. Uh, again, I could go on and on. Let me just cite one more example here. Jerry Falwell, by his own admission, did not preach his first anti-abortion sermon until February of 1978. That's more than five years after the Roe v. Wade decision. So that's why I call this the abortion myth. The abortion myth is the fiction that evangelicals became involved in politics in an organized way in the 1970s to overturn Roe v. Wade, when in fact abortion was considered a Catholic issue by evangelicals in the 1970s until the very, very late um, 1970s, just prior to the 1980 presidential election. Now, you asked about Green v. Connolly. Um, let me say a little bit about Green v. Connolly, because Green v. Connolly really was the catalyst for the emergence of the religious right. Uh, the background for Green v. Connolly, first of all, uh, is, the, is the Brown v. Board of Education ruling of 1954, which mandated the desegregation of public schools in the words of the Supreme Court, with all deliberate speed. Uh, the second precedent for the Green v. Connolly ruling was, of course, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which forbade racial segregation in public institutions. That is, you know, any, any organization that was um, open to the public. The, the immediate background was Holmes County, Mississippi, and in Holmes County, Mississippi, the first year of desegregation, the number of white students in the public school system dropped from over 700 to 28. The second year of desegregation in Holmes County, Mississippi, that number of white students in the public schools dropped to zero. At the same time, several whites-only, church-sponsored segregation academies these are schools that were formed to evade desegregation in the public schools, applied to the Internal Revenue Service for tax-exempt status. And several parents in Holmes County said, wait a minute, this isn't right. So they filed suit to block the granting of tax-exempt status to these schools. That suit was joined with another suit that worked its way up through the court system to the district court for the District of Columbia. And on June 30th, 1971, the District Court for the District of Columbia issued a ruling that said, in effect, any organization that engages in racial segregation or racial discrimination is not, by definition, a charitable institution. And for that reason, it has no claim on tax-exempt status. And as the IRS began to enforce that ruling over the course of the 1970s, that got the attention of people like the people at Bob Jones University, for example, in Greenville, South Carolina, but also Jerry Falwell, who had his own segregation academy in Lynchburg, Virginia. And that, and by the way, there's a whole lot of evidence, and this is what, the reason I wrote the book. Uh, it's, the book is chock full of footnotes, so anybody who wants to go over the evidence, can do so for him or herself. But that is what provided the catalyst for the religious right. It had nothing whatsoever to do with abortion. Now, um, leaders of the religious right have um, tended to blame the Carter administration um, right. <laughs> for going after their institutions, Christian institutions. And it, it sort of fits into their, their narrative about persecution from the left and so forth. Uh, 
But actually, right. as your book points out, very interesting, it was actually the, the Nixon administration and the Ford administration who really um, started pressuring. Um, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> really brought the handle down on uh, desegregating these these institutions. It, it, it sounds ironic, <laughs> knowing the, the Nixon administration's, their Southern strategy and their, their views on yep. race and that. Can you talk about that history? Sure. Yes. Yeah. As I said, the, the Green v. Connolly decision of 1971 was um, really authorized the IRS to try to enforce this, uh, this ruling. And uh, several very important things came out of that. And, and they really, in many ways, that the the ground rules for the modern religious right, but as you said, uh, both Richard Nixon and Gerald Ford agreed with the uh, Green v. Connolly decision and supported the IRS in uh, either uh, with um, refusing to grant tax exemption or withdrawing the tax exemption. And for me, the milestone date really was January 19th, 1976 when Bob Jones University, after several years of resistance and warnings, oh, finally lost its tax-exempt status. And then to fast forward to the 1980 presidential campaign, the Reagan-Bush campaign and the religious right generally blamed Jimmy Carter and his administration for enforcing these actions that deprived these segregated evangelical schools of their tax-exempt status. But if you go back and uh, look at that date again, January 19th, 1976, that was an important date for Jimmy Carter. There's no question about that, but not because he had anything whatsoever to do with that uh, rescission of tax exemption at Bob Jones University. January 19th, 1976 was the day that Carter won a plurality in the Iowa Precinct Caucus, as his first step toward winning the Democratic nomination and eventually the president, the presidency. He did not become president until a year and a day after Bob Jones University lost its tax exemption. And yet the Reagan-Bush campaign and the religious right blamed Jimmy Carter for Bob Jones University losing its tax exemption. Mm. Now, um, so the religious right didn't, didn't start um, as a... Uh, reaction to Roe v. Wade, but how did abort abortion finally become such a uh, galvanizing issue or defining issue for the religious right? And, and why was that, as your book points out, a very kind of a difficult journey for them? It was. It, it certainly was a circuitous uh, route to come to that uh, conclusion. And um, by the way, I, again, the, the, the book is, is full of, of evidence here in I would be, you know, I'd go on forever if I were to cite all of it. But uh, one of my sources here is Paul Weyrich, who was a conservative activist, uh, now deceased, who really was the architect of the religious right. And I had a conversation with him in November of 1990 in which I pressed him on this. I said, I want to make sure I understand you correctly. Uh, abortion had nothing to do with the genesis of this political movement, the, the religious right. He said, absolutely not. He said, I've been trying since the Goldwater campaign in 1964 to get evangelicals uh, active and organized in politics. He said, I tried everything. I tried the school, school prayer issue. I tried the women's rights issue. I tried the pornography issue. I tried abortion. Nothing got their attention until the 1970s when the IRS started going after the tax exemption of these evangelical schools. He was emphatic about this. And by the way, again, there's a whole lot of corroborating evidence, and I'm not going to get into that because we'd be talking <laughs> forever here, and I don't want to uh, do that. But uh, the, the evidence is overwhelming. And so how did abortion become part of this, uh, uh, this political movement? Well, it turns out it really was sort of an accident. What happened was that uh, Weyrich went to the head of the Republican National Committee in advance of the 1978 midterm election. And Weyrich, again, was looking for financial help to enlist and mobilize these evangelical voters. And he asked the head of the RNC at that time was uh, William Brock, a former senator from Tennessee, 
for money to help organize uh, these evangelical voters. And according to Weirich, uh, Brock looked at him and said, you're crazy. Who are these people? I'm not going to give you this money. And so uh, Weirich, being a fairly feisty guy, <laughs> and I think um, even his friends would acknowledge that, uh, decided to go out and, in his words, elect some improbable people to the Senate in that 1978 midterm election. Well, he focused on four Senate races, one in New Hampshire, the second one in Iowa, and then two Senate races in Minnesota, one of them for the unexpired term of Walter Mondale, who, of course, was Jimmy Carter's vice president. And in all of those races, the final weekend of that campaign, pro-lifers, Roman Catholics, leafleted church parking lots, and two days later, in an election with a very, very low turnout, the favored Democratic candidates lost to anti-abortion Republicans. And in the wake of that 1978 midterm election, Paul Weirich recognized that he had his issue, that abortion would work for him as a way of mobilizing grassroots evangelical voters. And when you think about it, Abortion was a kind of godsend for the religious right, and I, I don't mean that uh, irreverently or, or flippantly, but I think it really was in the sense that it allowed Weirich and Falwell to shift the attention, to shift the focus of their new movement away from a defense of racial segregation to instead a defense of the fetus, which of course is a much more... Um, much more palatable sort of uh, political issue or popular issue. And uh, that's how it happened. But even as late as the 1980 presidential campaign, um, some I'm sure your listeners will remember that in many ways the turning point of that campaign was when Ronald Reagan, the Republican nominee, was down in Dallas, Texas, for a gathering of evangelicals at something called the Religious Roundtable. And he, uh, some, somewhere between 10 and 20,000 evangelicals were there, and uh, estimates vary. This is where Reagan famously strode to the podium and said, I know this group can't endorse me, but I want you to know that I endorse you and what you're doing. And brought down the House and arguably sealed the evangelical vote for Reagan in the 1980 presidential election. I read through Reagan's address out at his presidential library in Simi Valley, California. In that address, he talks about creationism. He goes after Jimmy Carter and the Internal Revenue Service for trying to enforce these anti-segregation um, provisions from the Green v. Connolly decision. And in that gathering, 10 to 20,000 evangelicals yelling at the top of their lungs, he didn't mention abortion even once in that speech. So that is how, well, another example of what I call the abortion myth, but it shows that how, how tenuous the abortion issue was even on the eve of the 1980 presidential campaign, presidential election. Mm. Now in your book, um, you talk about the history of evangelicalism going back to the uh, Second Great Awakening 200 years ago in this country. Um, when we think of white evangelicals today, we think Republican Party, right? Because they've been in lockstep with the GOP for the past uh, four decades. Um, but looking back on the history, um, as you, you document, um, white evangelicals uh, were, were very, had a very strong social concern. Obviously, um, I know um, Charles Finney, um, when yep. he made converts, he would immediately sign them up for the abolitionist movement. Um, right. Right. And here we are today, you know, um, at, at the other end of the, the spectrum. How, how did that, that happen? Could you talk a little bit about that history, too? Sure. That's one of the reasons I wrote the book. Why, one of the reasons I wrote Bad Faith was to say, listen, if you look at the agenda of the religious right and you set it alongside of the way that evangelicals... Uh, behaved uh, politically and culturally in the 19th century, it's a huge, huge contrast. And uh, in the early chapters of the book, I, I try to go through that history very quickly. I don't want to uh, 
I, I, it's a short book, as you know, and I, I meant it to be a short book. I didn't want to bore readers. I want them to be able to access it, the arguments uh, very quickly. But what's striking to me about evangelical political activism in the 19th century is that evangelicals almost invariably were concerned about those on the margins of society. So, for example, as you mentioned, evangelicals were involved in the abolitionist movement. Now, I want to be clear, there were Southern evangelicals and Southern evangelical theologians who defended slavery. I'm not going to deny that. But in the mm -hmm. North in particular, evangelicals were very much concerned about the abolition of slavery because they didn't see it, see it as consistent with the principles in the Bible. Evangelicals were in the forefront of the common school movement, or what we would call public schools or public education today, because they recognized that this was the best way to help those in the lower rungs of society, that is the children of those less privileged, to allow them to become educated and to advance themselves, to move up into the middle class. Evangelicals were involved in various peace crusades in the 19th century, and I've even run across an instance of evangelical, an evangelical organization dedicated to gun control in the 19th century. Evangelicals were also, and this is a, a very significant development, I think, evangelicals were very much advocates for women's equality, including voting rights in the 19th century, which was considered a rather radical notion. And even into the early part of the 20th century, evangelicals were involved in labor issues, uh, the uh, dignity of labor, uh, supporting the, the rights of workers to organize, for example. Uh, those were evangelical cons uh, concerns. And so if you juxtapose that agenda with the religious right, I think you see that it's uh, very much in contrast with what we see as the political agenda today. And uh, that's, again, one of the reasons I wrote the book was to say, hey, uh, this is who we are as evangelicals. And by the way, I come out of this movement. I'm very much identified with it myself. And I've spent uh, the last several decades trying to call evangelicals back to their better selves, <laughs> into their own history and say, hey, uh, this is who you are. This is your heritage. This is your history. Uh, let's uh, live up to it rather than uh, uh, turn the other cheek. Well, it's a very inspiring history, and I thank you for, for documenting that and reminding us where we come from. Um, w would you say that abortion today has become a smokescreen for institutional racism within evangelicalism, or, or do you think that's going too far? Well, I... It, I think a case can be made for that. I, I'm reluctant to go, to go that far because I, I don't want to question, and I don't question, the motives of those who are you know, fervently dedicated to the anti-abortion cause. And I, and I have a great deal of sympathy for that cause. I, I happen to think that uh, they're going about it in the wrong way. <laughs> uh, my own shorthand on this, and I'm happy to talk more about it if you like, but uh, my own shorthand is I have no interest in making abortion illegal. I would like to make it unthinkable. And what that points mm. to for me is a, a difference between approaching the issue from a legal perspective or re approaching the issue from a moral perspective. Uh, I think abortion is a moral issue. It's not a legal issue. And I think that, uh, I, again, I have a great deal of sympathy for the anti-abortion cause. I really do. Uh, but I do think that they, they've taken the wrong tact and uh, I, 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 having said that, again, I don't want to question the motives of those who are involved in it, because many people have you know, really devoted their lives to that cause. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, there's a part of me that honors that, even though I think that uh, the strategy is uh, misguided. Mm. Uh, you, you write in your book, um, I don't find much that I recognize as Christian in the actions and policies of the religious right. Um, in fact, you've written a book, uh, Thy Kingdom Come, How the Religious Right Distorts the Faith and Threatens America. Uh, a very provocative title. Do you think the religious right is distorting the very gospel that it claims to uphold, and, and why? I do. I do. Uh, you think about uh, 
it, it's, it's not so much the avowed policies of the religious right. It's it's the people with whom they um, they consort. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. You know, I, I, of course, uh, you know, Donald Trump, I suppose, in the 2016 election would be a, a prime example of that. But I think there are others as well. Uh, and and uh, these are people... Uh, that is, people affiliated with the religious right who talk about family values. Well, let's talk about family values for a moment. And uh, I, I don't seriously think you can anoint Donald Trump as your cha- champion if you're supporting family <laughs> values. Now, some people will will, will uh, dispute me on that, but uh, I, I think I'm fairly safe in, in in saying that. But other things as well, and and it, this this predates Donald Trump. Uh, immigration policy. Well, the Bible is pretty clear, and Jesus himself is pretty clear about welcoming the stranger. Now, I understand mm-hmm. you have to understand. You have to uh, you have to look at that passage and 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 try to uh, understand it in terms of issues of national sovereignty, sovereignty, and so forth. I understand it's not an easy thing, but just to kind of come out blithely and say that uh, that we're going to turn away every immigrant or every refugee who comes to our borders, I think, frankly, is not consistent with the teachings of Jesus, or even with the, the, the Hebrew Bible. Uh, the issues of, of equality, look at the way Jesus uh, responded to others, whether they be ethnic others, or uh, in particular, women. Uh, and Jesus and his attitudes toward women, I think, would hardly be consistent with some of the attitudes we see um, in the actions and the policies of the religious right. And I think one of the problems with the religious right, with evangelical political activism, is that almost from the beginning, that is from the 1980 presidential election, you saw an alliance with the far-right fringes of the Republican Party, and not the entire Republican Party. I, um, my next project, by the way, is a biography of Mark Hatfield, an evangelical Republican who would not, in fact, he was not uh, by any means a, a fan of the religious right. Uh, but as the religious right affiliated itself with those far right fringes in 1980, which in, in the succeeding decades have really become now the center of the Republican Party, uh, I think it drew evangelicals uh, rather uh, dramatically toward uh, the political right. And in so doing, evangelicals, uh, I think, lost their religious and, and uh, theological ballast and uh, really surrendered their principles to those uh, far-right partisans. Now, um, let me quote from your book again. You say, um, I have often defended evangelicals against the charge of racism, but the, um, here I'll paraphrase, the 2016 election um, caused me to reevaluate that stance. Um, uh, can, can you explain what you mean? Sure. Well, I mean, I think uh, like many Americans, I was startled by the figure that comes out of the 2016 ele- election that uh, 81% of white evangelicals, and I think the modifier white here is awfully important, supported Donald Trump in 2016. And you know, like <laughs> like other Americans, I try to <laughs> try to make sense out of that number. And uh, frankly, what I decided, uh, I think there are probably three reasons is what I finally decided on this, although I'm open to other perspectives and maybe I need to reconsider this. Uh, I think there were three main reasons. I think one was the longstanding and frequently stoked hatred toward uh, Hillary Clinton. I think a lot of evangelicals uh, simply couldn't imagine themselves voting for Hillary Clinton in 2016. I think the second reason is that Evangelicals, particularly those on the right, identify with the rhetoric of victimization. This has been a very powerful strain within uh, the religious right ever since uh, the, uh, the 1980 presidential election. And nobody speaks the language of victimization more fluently than Donald Trump. It's always about him, of course. He's the one who's the victim. But uh, I think evangelicals identified with that sort of uh, rhetoric. But I think finally, the 2016 election allowed the religious right finally to give up the pretense that this was a movement about family values and to return to the core principle behind the formation of the movement, which was, as we said earlier, a defense of racial segregation or 
um, just to unprettify <laughs> that phrase, racism. No, that's not to say that all people who supported Donald Trump or all evangelicals who supported Donald Trump are racist. I'm very careful not to say that in the book. I don't believe that's true at all. But there's something about the racist rhetoric in the Trump campaign that I think appealed to religious right voters. And that allowed uh, this whole movement to circle back to one of the charter or the charter principle behind the formation uh, of the movement. And um, the other thing that, that I discovered in the course of, of writing the book is that the missing link here really was Reagan himself, Ronald Reagan, uh, 1980. And uh, I was struck, as I did a little bit more digging into this, Ronald Reagan appeared into the political scene in California in opposition to the Rumford Fair Housing Act, which sought to provide equal access to both rental and rental housing as well as mortgages. He was an outspoken opponent of both the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Throughout his political career, he frequently invoked that racially charged phrase in his campaigns, law and order. And mm -hmm. nobody who is old enough to remember Reagan can forget his vile caricature of so-called welfare queens, women of color, who supposedly were living off the public dole in lives of, of luxury. He was never able to produce any of these welfare queens, by the way, but he didn't, that didn't stop him from talking about them. And for mm -hmm. me, the clincher was the fact that Ronald Reagan opened his general election campaign in 1980 on August 3rd in, of all places, Philadelphia, Mississippi at the Neshoba County Fair. And this is the place where 16 cent summers earlier, members of the Ku Klux Klan in collusion with the local sheriff's department abducted, tortured, and killed three civil rights workers during Freedom Summer 1964. And lest, you know, Reagan, of course, was the master of symbolism. And lest anyone miss his meaning on that occasion at the Neshoba County Fair, he said, I believe in states' rights, thereby invoking the age-old segregationist battle cry. So I think that the link between the origins of the religious right in defense of racial segregation in the 1970s and Donald Trump in 2016 and, of course, again in 2020, uh, frankly, was Ronald Reagan. And even though that evangelicals regard him as something of a political messiah, I think that a closer examination of Reagan, his rhetoric and his policies um, suggest that he's the uh, he's He's the link between those two historical moments. Mm. Now, um, you also write that uh, the religious right was never about the advancement of biblical values, but about the per perpetuation of racial segregation. Um, and as you said, you, you, you make it very clear in your book that you don't think that all evangelicals are, are racist, but um, perhaps... You know, would you say that most evangelical voters are not aware that they're being hoodwinked, or are they willingly sort of going along with it uh, for other reasons? Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, obviously, I can't enter into the minds of individuals. Uh, I, I don't. I don't. I don't think they would think of themselves as racist. I, I, I don't, and uh, I, I don't believe they are. As I've made clear, you know, both in this conversation, I think, and certainly in the book. But the analogy I use in the in the book is that of a building. You could have you could construct this beautiful building with all sorts of architect architectural uh, niceties and uh, filigree or whatever you want to do, whatever you consider to be uh, a beautiful architectural structure. But if it is built on the foundation of rotten timbers, I think the entire structure is compromised. 
And so I think mm-hmm. what's called for is uh, an acknowledgement and even repentance. I think uh, I write in the book that repentance is good for the soul. <laughs> and I say that as someone who is often repenting of many things uh, yeah. as, a, as, a, as a fallen creature myself. Uh, repentance is good for the soul. And I think if evangelicals, um, first of all, are made aware of the origins of the movement to which they've given such extraordinary fidelity, and then also become aware of a different way, uh, the way in which their uh, predecessors as evangelical activists behaved in the 19th and the early 20th centuries. Uh, that uh, maybe we'd have a different outcome, maybe we'd have different policies that would be pursued by these folks. Uh, that's my fervent prayer. Uh, mm. I, I, I would love uh, to see evangelicalism be reclaimed from the, uh, uh, from the distortions of the religious right. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I wrote the book. Uh, I'm glad that you did write the book. It's one of my prayers as well. Um, uh, you, you talk also in the book about um, single issue, issue voting, uh, single issue voting um, as a uh, tragic corollary to uh, partisan dualism. Um, and can you talk about what you mean by that, and, and why is why do you think uh, single issue voting is is so dangerous? Well, I think it's dangerous because it's always uh, it, it always uh, uh, distorts. You know, the political perspective and, 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 and political um, behavior. Now, you have uh, all sorts of, of folks in the religious right who claim that we're, we're single-issue voters on the matter of abortion and opposition to abortion. Well, again, as I said earlier, uh, I honor that sentiment. I, I don't share it entirely because I think the tactics of the anti-abortion movement are, are misguided, but uh, I, I understand that. But... I think you also have to account for the fact if you take that position, you're probably also aligning yourself with, uh, frankly, a lot of unsavory politicians. And I put Donald Trump, frankly, at the head of that list, but uh, others as well, as well as a lot of uh, unsavory policies. You know, again, look at issues of race, look at issues of immigration, look at issues of uh, women's rights and women's equality. Uh, I think those have to be considered as well. Uh, I think, uh, sure, uh, w- would my life be simpler if I voted only for or against on a, uh, a, a politician or a, pl- a political party because of one particular issue? Sure, I, uh, but I also think that's intellectually lazy and frankly religiously irresponsible to do so. Uh, we have to consider a much broader perspective in um, our voting behavior, it seems to me. Now you you um, mentioned a few times that you um, were sympathetic with the uh, uh, the, the goals of uh, the um, anti-abortionists, uh, but you did not agree with their tactics. How, how do you think the church should um, approach abortion or, or combat abortion, or what do you think would be the better way to um, try to transform our society so into a society that we don't ab- abort our, our children. Sure. Yeah, I, 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 I think that's, that's uh, um, I think you, your, your question, embedded in your question is the answer to the question. That is to say, I think we have to embark on the much more difficult task and longer term task of changing the moral climate around that issue. Um, one of the things that's striking to me is that the one thing that both sides of the abortion issue agree on, uh, that is uh, the so-called pro-life movement and the so-called pro-choice movement, is that making abortion illegal is not going to significantly diminish the number of abortions. Um, It's going to drive uh, the whole abortion process uh, underground in in dangerous ways for, for many, many women. And I think Rather than making it illegal, I think we should, as I said earlier, make it unthinkable. And that involves changing the moral conversation around that issue. And I could even see, I, and I would support, uh, public service announcements, uh, 
asking people to think very carefully about that issue and to think about it in moral terms rather than in legal terms, whether or not abortion is legal or not. But as I say, uh, the, the legal uh, so-called solution, and frankly, I don't think it is a solution, but the legal uh, redress uh, seems like a shortcut, I think, to the anti-abortion crowd. But real change, I think, involves changing the moral conversation around the issue of abortion. And that's where I think these efforts should be devoted. Certainly one of the major factors in, in uh, whether a uh, woman has an abortion or not is the issue of poverty. It, it's not the only factor. Um, it's not always. Absolutely. Major, major. Go ahead. No, and you're, no, you're absolutely right. And uh, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not up on the, the the latest uh, uh, find, findings on this. But uh, when I looked into the issue a, a few years back, probably when I was writing Black Kingdom Cup, uh, what I discovered was that since Roe v. Wade made abortion uh, legal and accessible, uh, the rate of abortions during Republican presidencies and Democratic presidencies was very different. And that is to say, during times of economic prosperity, particularly for those on the lower rungs of society, which coincided generally with Democratic presidencies, <laughs> the number, the rate of abortion was far lower during these Democratic administrations than they were during Republican administrations. Now, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm vague on specifics because I don't have the information uh, at hand, but that at least was the case when I looked into the issue uh, several years back. Um, you, um, you talk about how um, in, in the past um, these uh, uh, Christian uh, institutions we talked about earlier um, used to boast, we, we take no federal funds. Yeah, um, right. We're fairly targeted by uh, the government, um, but but as you argue, uh, a tax exemption is in itself a form of public subsidy. Um, can you explain? To me yeah, that? exactly. No, that's a great question. That and that gets to uh, one of the things that that Weirich was able to do very very deftly in the early years of the religious right. Um, again, we talked about the origins of the religious right and defense of racial segregation, racial discrimination. And Weirich was, uh, again, savvy enough to recognize that that really wasn't the, going to um, suffice as a um, justification for this uh, new political movement. So very, very craftily, and he, I, I give him credit because he, he really was a uh, sort of master strategist. He began very early on to reframe the question away from uh, defense of racial segregation to a defense of religious freedom. <laughs> and, this, and this, of course, is now one of the pages in the playbook of, of the religious right these days with the uh, Hobby Lobby case, for example, and, and, and the, the Colorado um, Baker case and so forth. Uh, so he began to say, Weirich began to say back in the 1970s, Oh, the Internal Revenue Service is trying to uh, uh, impinge our, on our religious freedom or the religious freedom of these institutions. Very, very cleverly not mentioning the fact that public that tax exemption is a form of public subsidy. That is to say that tax-exempt institutions are supported by the public. I give just to, to take a local example uh, uh, you, you've been a pastor. Uh, I've been uh, uh, I've been a rector of, a, of a, an Episcopal parish, and in in both cases, and I'm sure you'll attest this to this, uh, your congregation did not pay local taxes or property taxes or federal taxes for that matter, other than social security taxes. And that means that the people in our communities had to pony up a little bit extra for police protection for fire protection, for local services, public parks, and so forth. Frankly, to support our tax-exempt institutions. Now, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I think um, tax exemption for religious institutions is uh, very defensible. 
the founding fathers, for example, understood the value of voluntary associations, and uh, so I think there's an argument to be made. But it does not obviate the fact that tax exemption is a form of public subsidy because the public supports these institutions. Uh, and so Weirich was very careful in the 1970s to, not to say that, that, oh, no, our religious freedoms are being uh, oppressed somehow by the IRS coming after these uh, tax-free institution, tax-exempt institutions. Uh, it was very, very crafty on his part. But this is an argument that, as, as you know, and as I said earlier, has been now been adopted by uh, other organizations associated with religious right, disingenuously, I believe. It sort of reminds me of how the um, Civil War was sort of reframed in uh, yes. history uh, from a, um, a reaction, you know, to pre preserve uh, the rights of slave owners to uh, an issue of states' rights. Yes, right. Yeah, the war between the states, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Right. And, and that, and that, import, that uh, points to the importance of rhetoric uh, as well, uh, because it, it shapes public perception. Even, you know, the, you know, the, the, uh, the so-called pro-life movement. Well, I think we were serious about it uh, for most of the, the, the uh, pro-life folks. Life begins at conception, which is a theologically defensible uh, argument, by the way, I, and I'm not, I'm not going to deny that. But for most of these so-called pro-lifers, um, you know, they, uh, and I, I'm generalizing here, and 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 that's that's always perilous. But uh, the real interest in defending that life, um, for all intents and purposes, ends at the moment of birth. And uh, this is when, of course. Uh, Anybody serious about being serious about being pro-life uh, should pay attention to the, the plight of that fetus when the fetus comes into the world. Mm -hmm. well, um, I am talking to uh, Reverend Dr. Randall Balmer, um, who is the author of Bad Faith, Race, and the Rise of the Religious Right. Um, Dr. Balmer, I want to thank you so much for being with us and uh, I, I highly recommend your book to uh, to everyone. Um, it's it's very very readable, um, very well documented, and uh, and you have a very lively writing style that uh, just really held my attention. I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, and I think it's an important book for this time in our history. Well, thank you. I that, that's high praise, and uh, that's precisely because I wanted to do just that, and uh, I really appreciate those those kind words and for for this conversation as well. And your, your book is available uh, through Amazon and other uh, online booksellers? Uh, it is, and uh, actually it's been uh, uh, trending as number one in uh, the categories of Christian fundamentalism and religious fundamentalism. I'm not sure to be proud of that or, or <laughs> chagrined by that, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased it's doing well. Oh, that's great. Well, congratulations on that. And uh, thank you so much again for, for being with us. And this is... Uh, Pastor S.G. Munson, signing off.